Broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America. Bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Ben Crossman, and I hope all of you are having a fantastic day because we have a great show planned for you where we're going to try to connect with our guests here in a moment. Uh, Hopefully they're all standing by ready to go. Normally we do this before, but uh, man, what a crazy day it's been. So, hey, first off, uh, I hope everyone out there is, uh, you know, kind of just doing their thing. Obviously, another week left of Computer America. We uh, we are going on break here. Our last show of the year is going to be December 21st. And then after that, January 2nd is when we are slated to come back. So about two whole weeks. Really want to drive that point home. Don't want people wondering why there's so many uh, best ofs and reruns. It's, uh, yeah. There you go. And then, of course, when we come back, we'll have all the excitement around CES to uh, to contend with. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Now, let's see a couple of things. Uh, ComputerAmerica.com. That's where you'll find everything after the show. We promise, promise, promise. We will get the show notes up for you uh, with a link to our guest website and all that more right there at Computer America. So uh, let's see. So with that, we also have, um, you know, lots of articles, lots of reviews, everything like that at Computer America. And in the meantime, we uh, we have a show to put on. Oh, and by the way, check out our live video feed, twitch.tv forward slash Computer America or podcast wherever podcasts are heard. Simply punch in Computer America. OK, now, as I said before, we, uh, you know, we were getting this all together and, uh, you know, we were hoping that we were going to get this all sorted out. But, uh, yeah, we are going to try to right now. So we're going to go ahead and mute half the conversation. You are going to hear half of it. And uh, we are going to try our best to keep this short because if worst comes to worst, we have a bunch of computer and technology news to share with you. But uh, before that, let's go ahead and try to get our guest on and see how this goes. So just one moment. I apologize for this. So obviously the phone's ringing. You can't hear in the background. Hi, is this uh, Mr. Scott Jones? Hi, uh, can you hear me? Is this Scott Jones? Oh, hey, Scott. Uh, uh, we had an interview set up. Uh, uh, this is Ben with Computer America uh, about heavily pixelated. Oh, sure. Uh, I, I mean, I, I give you a couple minutes. Uh, are you all set to go? I mean, ha- perfect. All right, perfect. So, all right. Uh, let's go ahead, bring you on. Uh, we had you kind of potted up, but uh, if you're all ready to go, everyone, allow me to introduce you. First time meeting him myself. So, very excited to hear a story. Uh, everyone uh, on the phone with us now is Mr. Scott Jones. He is the uh, producer and host of Heavily Pixelated, and he has quite the story to share with us here on Computer America, and something that is also near and dear to my heart because, hey, you know, uh, video games are very cathartic for uh, myself and, and many, many of my friends. So, as I said, looking forward to talking with him. Everyone, say hello to Mr. Scott Jones. Scott, how you doing? Hey, I'm good. Thank you so much. I, it is a real honor to be here today. Uh, our pleasure, our pleasure. And uh, and obviously, you are here with a tale, and uh, and you know we were able to uh, you know really catch uh, you know some of your backstory. But we are going to go into this interview assuming no knowledge, and uh, you know, we have this list of questions. And the first question that we have uh, can be very philosophical, but I'm going to let you answer it the best way that uh, yeah. you can think of. Uh, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been waiting my whole life for someone to ask me that question. I actually, I'm, uh, I'm a, a kid from a small town in upstate New York. Uh, and I grew up in, in the woods really. Um, I was bored and, uh, very curious about the world 
And uh, video games played an important role for me at a very young age. And games, you know, I'm in my 40s now. Uh, video games as a medium was, was a very new medium at the time, very foreign medium, completely foreign to my parents. I was really part of the first generation of people to grow up with this uh, entertainment medium. And the Atari 2600 was, was the reigning console of the day. And it, it was sort of awful. Uh, mm -hmm. And there wasn't a lot that was really compelling about it. But I, I think I think all of us, if we, we look back on those times, I think we all felt that there was real promise there, that there was a future there, that this was a new way to, to tell stories and it was a new way to consume stories. And so, um, yeah, I was, I've, been, I've been a nerd my whole life, even though I've done other things that aren't especially cliche, nerdy stuff. Like I've, I've played football for a long time and, you know, I, in my heart, Secretly, all I wanted to do was was be on my computer, be on, be playing video games, talk to other people who were on, you know, in, into computers the way I was, and into video games the way I was, and um, yeah, that I really feel like that's that's so much uh, that describes so much of who I am now. Yeah, and obviously that uh, that experience and something that I guess you try to really convey on your podcast, uh, is that experience is not unique. That's that's actually uh, you know something that's unique to our generation, but an entire generation I think kind of shares that experience. Uh, talk about heavily pixelated. Uh, what is it? Uh, I mentioned it's a podcast, but you know obviously this came from this idea. Uh, what has heavily pixelated turned into? Well, uh, heavily pixelated is really my answer to the media. Every time something tragic happens, every time there's a, a school shooting or just something awful, you know, the first thing investigators do is they go to the uh, the person who who did, you know, committed this awful tragic act and they look at his computer or his video game console and they say, well, we found a copy of Doom on his hard drive. So that explains it. And that's maddening to me, and it's always been maddening to me. It's it's been like it's an old, hoary uh, media tale that the media just keeps sharing, and keeps going back to, and then parents well, get nervous uh, and, and start uh, wringing their hands. Yeah, and, and I'm gonna jump in here because you know, we we've had a lot of uh, you know a lot of experts that are on the show talking about this, and while I think that there's still a lot more to explore on this side. I will say that for video games and for violence and any kind of link or causation thereof, it's it, it's not been proven. Um, you know, maybe impulse control and things like that you need to be researched. But it, it follows so much out there for you know kind of hand me down or contrived um, knowledge. It, it, like a, like when I was growing up, my parents said, "Don't sit too close to the TV. You're going to hurt your eyes." That's right. And that's yes. not true either. I I, I mean we. Nope. we but like that same line is still used to this day and everyone, you know, I guess kind of spout, you know, espouses the same uh, idea. How, how do you think that, you know, violence in video games kind of got intertwined like that? Like, was it just Doom or, I mean, wh why do you think that rumor kind of started? Well, you know, like I, I was part of... I, I was part of traditional media for a long time. I wrote for, you know, a lot of newspapers and magazines and, you know, uh, and, and now, you know, obviously websites and things, you know, but the traditional media, you know, they're feeling the pressure, especially now that we live in the age of social media to make sure that their numbers are high, to make sure that their readership is significant. Uh, and, you know, obviously if you're running a TV station, you want something that, is going you you want news stories that are going to generate controversy i mean now the united states without getting too uh, political now we have a president who's interested in creating controversy which is not uh, an especially healthy thing but um but yeah media for a long time has gravitated towards things where you know stories that would really push people's buttons and uh, that was a story that always pushed people's buttons. The kids would get irritated and upset by it, like I would be when I saw those stories 20 years ago. And, and I'm still, even now, I just, I just want to pull my hair out. Um, and parents would just say, see, I've been telling you these things are dangerous, you know? And so it's a story that, that websites and even now news channels keep going back to again and again. And it really just sort of, it does exactly that. It intertwines violence 
and uh, video games in an unfortunate way that really, I feel like, shines a, you know, a light on video games that make, makes them seem really detrimental to, to culture, to society, to peacefulness. You know, the gamers that I know are some of the most articulate, smartest, most evolved humans that, that I've ever met on the planet. I've met people in all kinds of sectors. Um, and I just feel like I wanted to create a show uh, that really reflected that. I wanted to, to show the healthy ways in which people lean on video games during times of crisis in their lives. And so I thought, you know, I can really shake my fist at everybody and be angry and upset, or I can do something about it. And I can really create documents, can really prove, you know, what I've always known to be true. And so that's what I'm trying to do with Heavily Pixelated. I, I want to give people a forum in which I can sort of celebrate the, the you know, the, how smart and articulate and in touch with their own souls the gamers are. And I also wanted, you know, I wanted to really celebrate video games and shine a really positive, bright light on games that, that really makes them, you know, that really so, shows them for what they actually do for us. Yeah. So, and, and like I said, like to, to keep this conversation from just being, uh, yes, I agree, period, <laughs> because I have been playing video games since I was like four years old. I love the heck out of them. Like my first game was Warcraft. Uh, I did not turn yep. into an orc. Uh, things have been going well ever since. I, I will say that. But I do want to say that um, much like any other uh, subculture or any other kind of group of people that you can you know, place a, on a, a label on, um, the most relevant interview that I think to this conversation we had here on Computer America happened back in September we uh, we were fortunate enough, although unfortunate enough because of the circumstances, to talk to a gentleman named Ronald Casey. He uh, you know he was at he was at the I want to say Tallahassee, Tampa. I immediately regret. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Jacksonville, the Jacksonville shooting uh, yes. at the tournament, and you know what happened there. It was uh, you know, many claimed it was a gamer who gone you know who had just lost and lost his uh, you know, lost his mind and that kind of thing. And yep. admittedly, that one was a tournament over, I think, NFL. It was Madden. And yep. um, I don't think anyone can really compare, you know, uh, Madden to like Doom. But it did show that not it, like it doesn't give you an automatic get out of jail free card just because you're a gamer. And, and I think that this also applies to any group of people. But there are crazies even within the gaming culture, aren't there? Like we still have to differentiate. We can't just say everyone here is good. Like it's, it's still, uh, For sure. people still have to be vigilant. Every subculture, you know, there's, there's people, you know, there's people who I live with next door to here in Toronto, who I'm sure are not the healthiest people. I, I don't know. They're everywhere, but you can't sort of just throw, everybody under the bus and just say, well, gamers are all exactly this or gamers are all exactly that. You, you, you know, you really need to look close, more closely at people. You need to uh, look at what, you know, the stressfulness of life at this point, you need to look at the availability of guns. You need to look, you know, parents would rather blame video games than blame themselves. It's just easier for them mm -hmm. to do that. And it's easier for newspapers to sell copies of their paper if if they tell this story again and again and, and you know it's it's easier for 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 news stations to get more viewers if they just keep telling these stories again and again and so they they after you tell these stories enough times they sort of become like part of the mythology they sort of become almost like accepted facts and i just wanted to say this you know i wanted my show to really be a counterpoint mm. just to say no 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 you really got to look a little more closely here you really <laughs> you really got to examine things and, and look at the facts a little more closely here and the facts are you know in my experience games have helped me through incredibly difficult times as an adolescent and as a 49 year old man like they have been doing that for me for years and I'm not the only one, as you can hear on the show, like I just, time and time again, games give us that emotional catharsis that we need in our, in, you know, trying times and difficult times. They, they, you know, they give us problems to solve when we can't solve the bigger problems in our lives, when we're grieving for things like 
games have been there and games are a kind of therapy for people. And yeah, for sure. Games are still can be bad for people. You know, games can, can still be, you know, play off of people's uh, obsessive compulsive disorders, Mm -hmm. or they can, they can be something that, that people engage in uh, to an unhealthy level. And, and, and that's not the kind of gaming I'm talking about here. I'm talking about people who are grownups who've consciously gone out and purchase things, but they get up and go to work every day and they still participate in life, but they still use games as something that can actually have an answer for them, you know, in their times of need. And I I don't, you know, I can't recall anybody ever really talking about games in this way before. And and I don't really know what I'm doing on this show. You know, (laughs) I'm trying to figure it out for myself. I just know that there's something there. I feel it with every guest I have on the show. And I feel it with every story that I tell on the show. I feel it. I feel like it becomes more and more true. Um, and so I just keep telling the stories and I keep believing that this message will finally get through to people. So we, we, ha- we have a counterpoint now. So tell us, uh, you know, obviously about the show, uh, what kind of guests are you really aiming for? Because if you're looking for anyone who's ever played a video game, you got billions of potential guests. If you're looking for people who really have used video games as a coping mechanism, again, I think you're in the hundreds of millions. Uh, What makes a good story for you uh, in relation to Heavily Pixelated? Well, uh, I mean, for me at this point, I've had, um, I've had all kinds of, of guests on really the, the, you know, one of the, the, the first episode that I ever recorded, uh, I, you know, when I was, and I'm spoiling this episode a little bit, uh, but I'm going to tell you anyway, um, I became friends with, a, with, uh, with a guy named James, who was a filmmaker when I first moved to Toronto and we went to see star Wars movies together and, and we talked about video games and we, you know, we went out for coffee and like we had, you know, just like a, a regular male relationship, you know, and, uh, and then, uh, he said, yeah, I'll be on your show. And so he came on and I, you know, at that point I wasn't really sure what direction I was going to go, but he told me a story about how he was grieving for the loss of his grandmother and how he, um, played mass effect to grieve. And so he played the trilogy, the original trilogy. We did the interview. And then a week or two after we did the interview together on social media, he announced that he was transgender and that he was embracing um, w- what he felt was his true identity and his true, his true gender. And he, he was presenting as a woman now. And so he, that's not easy. James no longer really exists. And James is Ashley. And so I realized that in Mass Effect, you can play either as a man or as a woman. And, and we went back and did, had another conversation. And I had a conversation with Ashley this time. And we talked about, you know, how she played Mass Effect and and the kinds of choices she made for herself and the kinds of choices she made for her character in the game. And I do really believe that, like, her first steps as Ashley really took place in the game world of Mass Effect. I really believe that. And I think games can do, you know, some of the sh- episodes are really big stories like that. And that was a complicated story to edit. It was complicated to have the James interview and to have the Ashley interview, and to, mm-hmm. you know, decide what to use. But um, some of the stories are, are uh, you know, smaller too. I've had, you know, a guest on recently, a guy named Adam, who after he went through a divorce, um, he was trying to figure out how to introduce a new significant other to his family. And so he talked about how he really leaned on rock band. You know, he just, you know, his new partner came in to the family by playing, playing into, by stepping into the role of uh, a bass player in this, the rock band that they had. And he talked about, all, you know, sort of the, the pressure was kind of off. It wasn't like they were all sitting around a table looking at each other. Instead, they were working together to get through, you know, whatever crazy song was in Rock Band 2 that they were working on at the time. And I just, you know, there, there, was, there, there was a therapeutic effect to introducing her 
to his family at this particular moment by using the game of rock band. And so those are the kinds of stories I'm looking for. You know, I've, some stories I've already done and I don't want to do them again and again, you know, mm-hmm. so I'm really looking for new stories that I haven't necessarily explored yet. And so, you know, I'm, that, that makes an ideal guest for me. You know, right. if, if it's somebody who, who's really in touch with who they are, you know, usually, you know, one of my questions for potential guests is I ask them if they've been to therapy, you know, and not everybody can say that they have, but the shows that have been really successful and really easy for me to edit are usually the guests who are so articulate and so in touch with who they are and what they've gotten from the experience of playing the video game that they make for just excellent guests. So th- that's that's my dream guest, really. <laughs> no, I, it, and and I I really did find uh, your show with Ashley very interesting. I mean, to to someone like me, I've I played Mass Effect and played all throughout. I always pick the guy character, and you know, mm-hmm. and, me too. Uh, the the <laughs> of course the events that happen and unfold therein. Um, you know, and, and I really didn't think twice, but. I guess when you are, or when game design happens, where you do give the player the opportunity to, you know, who who do you want to uh, see as a partner, and uh, mm-hmm. you know, and who do you want to have a relationship with? Like to me, a heterosexual, you know, guy. I was just like, male, female, female, we're good to go. And mm-hmm. I guess by presenting those options, it was a, it, it was a non-value for me. But for, I guess, someone, you know, someone like Ashley, they, I guess they could really reflect and say, well, that is an interesting question. You know, what do I really want out of, you know, out of this game and the by extension life? That's, uh, you're right. That that's really not part of a conversation that we've had on the show about video games. A lot of them revolve around, you know, uh, the yeah. latest sales numbers and things like that. Or do I like it? Do you, yeah. do you do you do you always play as the male character, or do you do you sometimes play as the female character? You know, I I I play WoW and uh, or World of Warcraft, and most of my yep. characters on there are female. But it's really not much uh, difference than just you know what I prefer for my avatar it has no reflect like it has the same non-value i think to me uh for other video games like i'll, I'll play it it's just a matter of aesthetics more than like any kind of you know self-identification I, if that makes sense yeah no i i but i also have uh friends who are present as heterosexual and male friends and you know they consciously choose to play as the female character in the game which always seems strange to me. I don't know if they've ever (laughs) consciously chosen the female character. And, you know, one of their answers for why they do that is they say, well, if I'm playing a third person action game, then I get to look at her butt for the next 15 hours, which is weird because I've never thought about looking really, except for maybe Bayonetta. Like, I don't really (laughs) look at, you know, I don't really study the characters. I usually just feel annoyed that they're asking me to do this. And usually I'm just like, yes, I'll take the man and blah, blah, blah. But I do think it's a significant moment for, for somebody, especially if you're questioning your own, your, your sexual identity. Like, how are you going to present yourself? And this, here's an option. Here's a fork in the road. Am I going to go this way? Or am I going to go this way? And what does that say about who I am, especially at this moment in time? And I feel like Mass Effect really came along at a moment when Ashley really needed to come to that fork in the road. And I know it was just in a virtual way, you know, that she was choosing to, to present as a, as a woman in, um, in Mass Effect. But I, I do think that's, that's a pretty bold move. And, and I think it, was, it really gave her a chance to, you know, really just present as a woman for the first time in her life. And then, you know, she had the courage shortly after that to, to do it in, in the real world, which is uh, obviously very challenging but Absolutely. she has more guts than anyone than any guest i've had on the show without a doubt for sure right so and, and you know like you said you have about seven episodes up on your website we're poking through them now they're all available through you know tune in stitcher all the other podcasts yep. uh just simply punch in heavily pixelated and i'm sure they'll all come up uh, very, very cool that, uh, you know, you're keeping a nice running archive on your show and, or uh, on your website. And I do want to ask you, I, I mean, you, uh, if I'm reading through, you know, you also have your writings up here and I think you did a bit about, um, being a game journalist. And this is a part where we, uh, I, we have a relationship with, uh, with another company. They are game journalists and they are raising 
essentially giving a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of people their first opportunity to be a video game journalist and, Mm -hmm. you know, teaching someone journalism, it's, you know, about ethics, about checking your sources about not, you know, not just following your gut, but actually following uh, the story. It's one thing, but after having them on the show for any number of months or years, I've noticed that video game journalism, I don't know if it's the demographic. I don't know if it's just how uh, amateurish, I guess a lot of people are uh, when they come into the field. But um, video game journalism has a long way to develop. It's uh, there's definitely a lot of passion, but ethics seem to be on the light side. Uh, talk about your perspective on uh, on technology, on games, and maybe as that relates to, I guess, the press that kind of gets out there about it. Uh, I mean, what's your perspective on the whole thing? Well, what's really happened is is unfortunate. The fact that the traditional media is is on the wane and it, you know, it's just like, uh, you know, I have new people who've worked for newspapers, at, you know, for 20 years and they're all, everybody's taken buyouts. You know, I had a friend who took a buyout from, um, you know, from Kotaku. I, you know, just like, it's hard to be in your, you know, even in your late twenties, but to be in your thirties and forties and then to try to have a family and to do this as a career, maybe you could do it 10 years ago, you know, but I, I think, the number of people who can do it and can make a, enough money to live, you know, that you can probably count on one or two hands. By like it's the not way, very Computer, many. Amer- Computer America is heard on the IRN radio network. And we have a column that is published across the nation in uh, a nationally syndicated column. Uh, no, no, I, I completely hear you. Uh, Computer America has been on the air for 27 years. And, you know, there's a reason that we primarily distribute. Of course, we solve our live radio program, but, uh, you know, over the past couple of years, we've really focused on digital, on YouTube, on, you know, yeah. kind of, kind of, you are, I just want to jump in and say you are completely right when it comes to uh, traditional media. Yeah. I mean, it's really sad. I mean, in fact, one of my projects in the last couple of years, I just want somebody to do it. I don't even want to own it anymore is game informer is fascinating to me because they're in, you know, Minneapolis, Minnesota, you know, sort of in the heartland of, of North America and, you know, it's, you know, like Andy McNamara, who's the editor in chief, that's really the only job Andy has ever had in his life. And he's had it all of his life. And they have a circulation that's around six or seven uh, million, mm-hmm. you know, and they have, um, which is amazing. Like, yeah. but you know, that it's, you know, Game Informer is not going to last forever. And it's one of the last of the old school magazines still making an old, you know, sort of doing it the old fashioned way. You know, they still have a month or two lead, you know, they still have to have meetings about what's going to be hot three months from now. So what are we going to put on the cover? I'd love to make a documentary about that because I don't think it's going to exist for very much longer. And I think it is fascinating and it is like a time machine. And, you know, I flew out there really uh, in August, I flew out there to record a couple shows and I, I visited Andy and, and Reiner and, and Matt Burtz and, you know, all those guys are veterans of the industry. They're the old school sea salt, like guys, you know, who are writing stories, still, pine, you know, not quite pounding them out on typewriters, but not far from it. Um, but I think it's fascinating. And I think it's a little sad, too, that these jobs and these places and these destinations, even some something like IGN, mm-hmm. like I, I don't know what IGN pays people. You know, I've never had a ton of respect for IGN. Uh, you know, I've more, I've been more in awe of what they've been able to create than the people who work for them. I don't, you know, I don't think they pay them very much. And so now, you know, trying to run an editorial magazine in San Francisco you know, like your pool of applicants for the with a salary that they're probably paying is is pretty limited. So you're going to get kids and you're going to get young voices. You're going to get people with a lot of energy, but not a lot of ethics necessarily and not a lot of reportage, not a lot of ability to tell a story or write a sentence. Um, I think those things are valued less and less. And I think, you know, I think we're only going to see video game journalism sort of decline more and more in the coming years. Uh, I, I, I don't know, you know, how you really turn this around at this point. Most of the people who are good at this don't really do it anymore just because they can't do it anymore. There's yeah. no option for them to do it anymore. 
Yeah, I, I've, I've certainly noticed that. Uh, it was really a surprise, I think, or uh, you know, really a telling thing when, uh, you know, even they, they had that one show on TV. Uh, it was like Attack of the Show and a couple other tech shows and gaming shows. They they went away and everyone's like, yeah, it looks like the money, you know, money's kind of leaving, but the passion's still there. Uh, hey, uh, Scott, that means uh, the music means we're going to take a break. Uh, if you don't mind, okay. we are going to continue on the other side. Everyone, yeah, go more, ahead. Yeah, more Computer America, more Scott Jones, heavily pixelated. Everyone, we'll be right back. Greece is cheap. But the airfare costs a fortune. Paris? Not much closer. And again, airfare. What about Puerto Vallarta? Let's face it, flying anywhere is just too expensive. Wait, what's this? low-cost airlines with one call to low-cost airlines you'll drastically slash your travel costs we're talking insanely low airline prices to any of your favorite destinations where would you like to go london rome costa rica australia wow that's cheap so why wait call now to learn how crazy cheap it is to fly anywhere in the u.s or international our prices are so low we can't publish them the only way to get them is to call to instantly hear the most amazing best deals on airlines travel. It's that easy. So call now and start packing. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. That's 800-215-4461. We are all Brother Wolf. Ten years ago, a group of locals banded together to create positive change. We took animals into our homes, held adoption events at local retailers, and talked to the community about our mission to help build a no-kill Asheville. A decade later, we have achieved so many victories for animals in need. There's been so much progress, yet there's still so much to do. As part of our year-long celebration, we encourage you to become a member of our special Compassionate Circle program. With a monthly donation of $10 or more, you will have behind-the-scenes access to the work we are doing at Brother Wolf. Our goal is to reach 1,000 members because we receive no government funding. Working together, we can help build and sustain no-kill communities. Learn more at CompassionateCircle.BWAR.org. We are a 501c3 tax-deductible organization. Welcome back to the Computer America Show. It is 32 minutes past the hour as we continue on here. And everyone, uh, we are continuing on with Scott Jones. Normally I ask, but uh, I, I definitely took liberty. And, uh, and Scott, I'm glad that you don't mind as we continue on here. Uh, he, of course, makes the Heavily Pixelated podcast. A lot of writing and, uh, yeah, and obviously a lot of great stories to, uh, to share with us. Although I want to pivot from how games are reported in the conversation about games and let's talk about games. Let's talk about um, uh, obviously through your show, you've you know seen a lot of uh, you know a lot of different sides and how people interact with video games. Um, anything that surprised you about uh, anything that surprised you about you know how people perceive them or how they use them as a coping mechanism? Because obviously, when let's say I need to really unwind at the end, end of the day. I need to turn on, you know, uh, city skylines or something like that and just lose myself in something. Uh, that's great. And I don't think that the developers ever said, you know, Ben's really going to need this uh, in two years and they don't make it for me. They just make uh, an experience and they hope that people buy into it. Um, what, what surprised you about games? Uh, well, you know, I mean, I, every time I walk in a game store and it makes me sad, like, that game stores are not going to be around for much longer. I mean, we'll, we'll have our vintage stores, but certainly some of the old school kind of chain kind of experiences are, are going to go away. Um, and that makes me sad because when I go to a game store, I look around and I see all the boxes and I, I feel like of, of all the kinds of stores you can go into game stores are my favorite because every box seems like a story that I, I want to hear. And every story feels like, it has the potential, to, it has the promise to, to really do something for me or teach me something or take me to a world that I've never been to before. Now, a lot of those worlds, I reviewed games for 15 years. Like a lot of those worlds aren't worth visiting, but the fact that there are worlds out there that, I, that are worth visiting, you know, like, we, like right now, 
we live at a time when Steam, like it's just an embarrassment of riches. Like there are just <laughs> countless games it's being never made been every day. Easier. It, it, it's never been easier. If you have it in your heart to make a certain kind of game, it's never been easier to get your game published into other people's hands than it has That's to right. be. It's great. But I don't know how easy it is to find an audience for your game like that. And that's one of the other things I do some consulting work now because honestly, I, I don't make any money off of my podcast. I just don't like I, and I'm fine with that for, you know, but I work with developers now and I try to help them figure out how they can get some attention for the, the whatever they're working on. And it's very challenging because of the rampant release schedule and because there are so many indie developers and, you know, sort of the, the same way in which, you know, making podcasts feels like it is sort of ascended to this democratic, you know, moment in which anybody can have a voice, can get their voice out there. Now, if we all talk at once, it's hard to know what to listen to. And Steam has a little bit of that problem. I think there are an awful lot of indie developers out there. And I think a lot of the developers expect too much and deliver too little. Um, but they're trying. And, and you know, I, I give them a lot of credit for trying. And so, I'm really trying to help them understand what their expectations should be for what they built and try to use the the knowledge that I have from reviewing so many games. You know, like I worked with Victor Lucas, who hosts Electric Playground, known as EP Daily, and no one has a bigger appetite for games than, than Victor. And so we, we would review probably seven to 10 games a week. And so all we did was was constantly just consume stuff. And I did that for 10 years working with Vic. Um, but because of that, I probably have consumed more video games in the last 10 years than um, anyone on the planet. Very, very few people, I would I would assume, have consumed more stuff than I have because of my relationship with Victor Lucas. Uh, and I, I I gotta say, I'm, I'm kind of on the opposite spectrum where I do get games for, for review here on the show. We have a gamer segment, Gamer Tuesday, but at the same time, uh, you know, there's just so many ways that I'm being pulled. I can't sit down and play video games all weekend like I want yeah. to. Um, but I will say that the few games that I do sit down and play, I do actually enjoy the story. I, I, at least that's just how I feel that, um, you know, there was a game a little while ago called Poncho. I actually really did enjoy that and it still kind of sticks with me i mean where do you like to see games go because you can you can raise the bar and say you know here's new minimum and lock out a bunch of people but that's probably not going to happen just because of the way digital distribution is uh where are you hoping to see this this whole industry kind of pivot to well, I mean, like my thoughts are a little more, you know, irritatingly sophisticated. Like <laughs> for me, I don't like that games always try to look like movies. You know, I, I really resent that. And I, I just think like video games are their own thing. Like it's like, a, you know, but I hate, I feel like it's an all awfully limited definition of what games can be by saying, well, it's like a movie, but you can play it. You can do anything in these experiences. So why are we still having a cinematic experience? Why do we have cutscenes? Like I asked those kind of stupid questions. You need um, to you but, need to get on the horn with uh, with makers of Final Fantasy because that is exactly why I stopped playing Final Fantasy fourteen. It came with like six DVDs yeah. and I was like, you know, I, I I don't have the arm strength to pop up my D V D player and, you know, switch DVDs that often. Um but I, I also think it's what you said way back at the beginning. It's um, traditional media is dying. I mean, movie theaters have only recently kind of hit a second wind. And even that, you know, even movie theaters, a lot of them are waning. Uh, it's trying to adapt an older, an older demographic to hopefully, uh, you know, kind of video games. It, it's, it's like, hey, do yeah. you like movies? And it's like old people. They're like, yeah, we love movies. And it's like, hey, it's like, <laughs> it's like movies, but you can play them. It, it's, yeah, it's, like it's adapting. It drove me nuts with uh, Uncharted 4, you know? Like, I, I just really struggled with, mm -hmm. like, the never-ending cutscenes and, yeah. like, all this great voice acting and great writing. I'm like, who cares? Like, <laughs> give me something to do, you know? I put my controller down for 20 minutes, and I'm sitting here waiting for me, to, like, to be prompted. See, like, but, but, but that can also be... 
That could also be, you know, kind of what you grew up with. Um, uh, just saying that, you know, you mentioned the NES a while ago. Like when you look at games, you know, Donkey Kong, Galaga, you know, Pac-Man, there was no cutscene. Or I guess at the yeah. beginning of Pac-Man, they introduce you to Inky Blinky. It's whatever. very small. Yeah, but but the game was, you know, trying to beat the the game. Like that was it. Yeah, it was. Just, that's exactly it. I, I love that as as the way you just put that. The game was just trying to be a game. Um, and I, I just wish games embraced that still instead of games that, you know, aspire to be, you know, pseudo movies, like lousy movies with bad scripts and bad set pieces. It's like, why are we doing this? Why can't we just create our own logic? Why can't we just write? We can write our own rules in this thing. And instead, we're still like, well, there's, you know, 17,000 lines of voice acting and dialogue. And they're like, who cares? Why are we doing this still? Like, I say that kind of in jest, but I also honestly would like someone to answer that question. So here's the thing. And, and, and this is going to evoke probably no controversy on your end. But uh, there mm. is uh, there's a new type of game coming out. And, and also, to be fair, there are games where... Uh, lots of dialogue is necessary. If you're playing an RPG, an RPG is going to be like that. If you're playing an arcade game, yeah, cut out with the voice line, cut out with the story, you know, make a really good arcade game. But I digress. Uh, there's a new genre coming out and it's still getting adapted, uh, or I'm sorry, it's still getting adopted and uh, people are still, you know, trying to figure out how best to get hardware into people's hands. But mm -hmm. VR, AR, that kind of thing, um, turning what it means to be a video game by changing the inputs. No longer is it mouse, keyboard, controller, paddle, whatever, uh, joystick. Yep. It's now uh, you. You are, you know, what do you think about those kinds of video games where, you know, it's different? That, uh, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, I do think it needs to be more experiential. I think it needs to, you need to go in and have these experiences without leaning on the sort of tropes of, TV and film and things that are more familiar to us. And, and, you know, I, I think there's promise with VR and AR and, and some of the new stuff that's come along, uh, you know, it's not quite there yet. Um, but I, I do think, you know, there's, we're, we're due for a big breakthrough of some kind, right? Mm -hmm. We're due, like we're really due. And, and I, I feel like we haven't seen one yet. And VR feels like, yeah, that's sort of what we want, but not quite right. And it's still awkward and still expensive. Um, but I, I, I do feel like something is coming. I do feel like somebody out there is working on something that is really going to flip our heads. You know, like it's going to be amazing. I don't know what it is. I wish I did. <laughs> uh, but it, like, those are the things that, that make me excited to get up in the morning. I think maybe, you know, maybe today is the day we find out what it is. I'm not even sure we'll recognize it at first. I, I think it'll just look too weird and foreign and then it'll grow on us quickly. And then so it'll become a way of life for us. But I do feel like there's a change coming. I do feel like we're stuck a little bit. We're stuck with sort of big budget games, you know, like the Ubisoft kind of, treadmill of cranking out you know another far cry another assassin's creed another seventeen thousand lines of dialogue another giant open world i do think something new is coming i don't know what it is uh but i'm excited for it yeah it's um you, know, you mentioned it with video game journalism and if you think it's hard to make money uh in journalism about video games try making money in video games it's uh it's just as cutthroat. And I think that's also part of the problem is that if you put out something that yeah. has already been successful, then, hey, maybe you'll be successful again. But otherwise, it's pretty it's pretty derivative. You know, it, it's been done before. You're not pushing any boundaries and no one's really going to be that excited. So it's, I still have um, like a, cor a corny kind of hope for games. You know, like I like Breath of the Wild, uh, you know, I loved it. Um, it was fun. But, you know, the thing. The thing that I liked most about it was that I felt like it had some of that old kind of Nintendo magic about it. Like there was a weird quality to it. Nintendo, um, and, and, and we've said this on our Gamer Tuesday, uh, or actually uh, one of our guests, he's uh, very much into Nintendo. Nintendo is mm -hmm. one of the few gaming companies out there that still make video games to have fun. They aren't there to, you know, bore you with the story. Like... They just, they just released uh, Super Smash Brothers uh, Ultimate mm -hmm. Four, whatever it was. Um, they just released that, and like they put in characters 
uh, across universes you would never expect. And I really feel like when I watch games like that, people can still have fun with Nintendo games. You can't say that often yeah. about, you know, Blizzard or Ubisoft. Or not many games are there for fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I just, I, I, I like that moment when I don't really understand how these things work. Because I played Breath of the Wild on the Wii U, um, unfortunately. <laughs> um, I just didn't get a Switch right away, and I, I was no longer a traditional media guy reviewing stuff, so Nintendo didn't send me one. Um, but I played it with this old, you know, out, quote-unquote outdated console, but there were still moments of incredible beauty in that game. Um, but I just like things where I'm just like, how did they do that? And I, I miss that I, a little bit about games. I miss the mystery of it. And sometimes I feel like we over report, we give too many postmortems and we give too many talks at GDC and E3 about how these things were done. Like I miss the days where we didn't really know these things. And I, you know, Breath of the Wild had a little bit of that flavor, that kind of old school. I don't know how they got the Wii U to do this. But it, it, like, I love that, that feeling of awe, like being, looking at a piece of technology and just being like, I don't know how this was done. I'm just going to dive in and go with it. I still, to this day, don't really understand how back in Pokemon Red or Pokemon Blue, uh, how to do the glitch for Mew. But like, like to, to, for me, it's just, you know, 20 years later to think about a, a yeah. cartridge in a game that can have a secret that the designer put in because he had a couple kilobytes left over. Um, totally. It was, was uh, you know, very, very intriguing. And of course, uh, we did make our parents buy the thick manuals from the, you know, from the video game store so that oh, we could. Oh, I love know, those. Yeah, it's, um, you know, the internet has ruined a bit of it. Uh, data mining has ruined that's a lot right. of, a lot of that's it. That's right. That's exactly right. The internet's ruined part of it. Uh, I miss not knowing. I miss the sort of, you had nothing to do but just sit there and not really know why, you know, like, I love the fact that that, you know, you know, the punch out game for the NES, like mm-hmm. there was, they're still discovering weird little Easter eggs and secrets in that game. And that is an old game, man. I think like, what Doom, is that? 1988. I, I think just this year, I think someone found the final Easter egg in doom, uh, or at least the, the final secret in doom where you kind of had to like, that. You, you had it, it's like 25 years later and i think like it was something about a monster had to push you through a special portal that you had to secretly find and like you couldn't walk through it yourself you had to be pushed through it and it led you to like a new area like that kind of thing still happened 25 years later i'm i'm sure that games try to do that but again data mining the internet just I don't think they do try to do it. I I, I really don't think think they do. Hmm. No, I I don't think they do it. And I I certainly, you know, like, I I feel like these guys are in such a rush to get these things out the door. They don't really know what it is that they built. You know, have you read Jason Shearer's book, Blood, Sweat, and Pixels? I have not. Like, it's just, yeah, Hmm. all of these, you know, Jason's a writer for Kotaku. And, you know, basically it's a series of stories about how games sort of get slapped together at the 11th hour and just pushed out the door. And some of those stories turn out great and successful, but sometimes they don't. I just don't think that, you know, now with teams, you know, trying to like, especially, you know, again, Ubisoft making these gigantic open world games. I don't think anybody has any bandwidth to go in there and bury a secret that we'll find 30 years from now. And, and it makes me sad. I, you know, I, I wish they did. I wish that these things had that kind of, you know, like time transcendent quality, you know, like it doesn't matter. We're going to find these things eventually. But I think people just have less patience, less time to invest. Um, and, you know, I think, I think we're missing out on one of the ways in which games used to entertain us. I think now with, with, with websites needing to update, you know, hourly, not just daily, You know, like people need stories. And so the industry just gives too many stories, which takes some of the mystery away from these things sometimes, you know? What is the end result for a maturing audience? Because uh, I think that, yes, some of my friends, they got houses, they got wives, they, you know, got dogs. And they don't play as much as they used to, but I still consider yep. them gamers. I still consider them, you know, if I invited them over and we sat down and played video games together, yeah, in, in, in person, it's crazy. But if I did that, I think they would jump right back into it. I think that the drive for a good video game is, at this point, 
uh, as as the years go, go by, there's going to be a lot of people looking for video games as they mature. And it's not going to be, you know, the reaction-based League of Legends. It's not going to be, um, you know, XYZ. Like, like you said, we probably don't know what it's going to be. But um, I, I, I guess if you have any advice for the video game industry or anyone making video games, uh, how, how do you have that kind of, uh, that mass appeal, I guess, would be the best way to put it? I mean, you know, just a couple of quick things. The, um, I, I do think once you're a gamer, you're always a gamer. Even if you don't play games anymore, you still have it in there, right? Like it's always part of who you are. It's always part of your identity. Um, but I, I do think that there's, uh, again, I sound like a, such a cranky old man saying this, but, you know, I sat at a roundtable discussion at a conference earlier this year where, you know, there were indie developers there who were saying we're worried about the next generation of gamers because they're not growing up with a controller in their hands the way that you did or the way that I did. And they're not going to know how to play things instinctively in the future. Controllers are complicated now, like, a, you know, the Sony's DualShock 2 or whatever we're up to. It's a complicated piece of machinery. Um, but kids are watching Twitch. Kids are watching somebody live stream a game and they're not feeling, they're not experiencing it the way you might experience or the way that I experience it, which is if I see somebody playing a game, I don't want to watch it. I want to go get the game and start playing it myself. But that that's not what the, the generation of people uh, is doing. They're mm-hmm. just watching this sort of funny, sexy, flirty, skilled gamer, you know, talk about this game as he or she is playing it. Um, and so we're, we're potentially losing people or potentially losing a generation of gamers to that. Um, and I don't know how we're going to combat it. I don't even know how real it is, but I do think that even if you have kids and you have a dog and you got a family and you got responsibilities, you got a busy job. I still think that you will always have an appetite. So as you age and as your friends age, you're always going to be able to invite them over and everyone's always going to be up for a game of Mario Kart. I, I, I will say about that because, uh, you know, whenever I'm not, or even actually when I am working, but I'm not on the show, uh, I, I watch a lot of Twitch. Uh, it's, it's, yep. it's actually what I do. And I will say that it's, for me, it's kind of like background noise. Like instead of a TV in the background, I have a, a yeah. Twitch stream in the background. But I will say that there are a lot of people who, with the advent of Fortnite, and I'm sure with uh, a couple other games help, but really with Fortnite, uh, viewership has exploded. Um, you know, mm-hmm. people watching YouTube clips instead of actually playing the game has really increased. But at the same time, this is something that I think uh, a lot of a lot of communities they overvalue themselves, and this is what I'm really starting to realize. be it Reddit, be it gamers, be it YouTubers, be it Twitch streamers, people like that. Um, don't get me wrong; it's very impressive when someone says, "Hey, mm-hmm. everyone, uh, tweet at uh, this developer," and you see twenty thousand tweets go up. But then you look at something like Fortnite and, you know, 20,000 tweets versus the 400 million active people who are playing the game. It's um, you may have a vocal community, but it's still a fraction, a fraction of what's actually out there. So, yes, people are adapting the way that they interact with video games, sometimes purely second player. Maybe they were the younger son and, and they they always were yeah. player B and they always got to watch their, you know, their brother play. But um I think there's still plenty of gamers. It might not be real, like you said, but I think a lot of communities overvalue themselves, which is a problem in and of itself. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I, I love this industry and whatever happens to it, I'll, I'll always be part of it. And like, you know, g- being a gamer and, and, you know, loving games and love, you know, I love going to the game stores. I love reading about games and talking about games. It's yeah. like, this is, I, my whole, so much of my life and my career has just been built around, around the stuff that I love. And I'm just grateful for that. And that again is something that I believe you really do try to highlight with your podcast. So let's focus back again. Uh, we have like three or four minutes. I did not expect sure, to share sure. the whole show, but uh, I'm happy that it did. Uh, so heavily pixelated. This is something that you try to highlight um, going forward. I, I mean, obviously building your audience, getting people to listen to the stories that you really explore. That's great. Uh, what else would you like to kind of improve about your show? Is it, uh, is it, you know, maybe getting, uh, you know, people, or, uh, uh, you know, I'll, I'll leave it to you. I really can't even phrase that in a good question. What would you like to improve with heavily pixelated? 
Uh, I just would like people to feel more open and confident when it comes to talking about things that are real in their lives. I mean, see this, the final old man thing I'll say in my interview today, which is, uh, you know, like I, I feel like we don't present ourselves as authentic people. Um, you know, everything is got, you know, we take a million photos so we can find one that we like and, and, and then share it on social media. Like I'm just, I just want people to be honest about who they are what they're feeling, what they're experiencing. And, you know, like Facebook drives me nuts um, <laughs> because there's so much dishonesty on there. And I, I don't know where, you know, I, I want more of that authenticity. I want more of that personal ownership of, of your own identity. And I, I, I want people to feel okay about being different. I want people to feel okay about what, what experiences they've been through in life, no matter how good or bad or painful, or, you know, if you go through a divorce, honestly, I, I I don't think that's bad. I feel like you're a more interesting, more evolved human being after that. So, you know, everyone just feels like it's a personal failure, but I feel like if you get through that, then you are a person, you are a human being who has this experience that not everybody else has. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that makes you a more valuable part of our tribe. So I, I want people to just feel comfortable about what they go through. And even in their awkward times and in their painful moments, those things all have value. They're all part of the human experience. And I would rather have us all trafficking in those kinds of moments than in, you know, the, 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 the sort of disingenuousness of, you know, Facebook uh, of yeah. saying I, I'm at the beach and I'm having the best day of my life. Like, I don't believe that because if you were, you wouldn't be on Facebook while you're at the beach. So, um, yeah, so, I really so, hope just, that people really take that message to heart. And, and, and I was going to contradict you a bit, uh, but you kind of said it there where, you know, even here we recommend that everyone follow, you know, follow myself and hey, even follow Heavily Pixelated on Facebook and Twitter, I'm sure. And, you know, your Twitter account. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, we hope that you engage in social media, but know that social media is not real. Like there's you just said that, you know, helping people through difficult times, through interesting times, through uh, the worst, best times of their lives, but also just realize that, you know, not everyone is going to be on social media and be like, I ate a ham sandwich today and overslept and now it's 2 p.m. in the afternoon and I'm not going to do anything yeah. today. Like everyone has those days, but you never see it on social media. And yeah, that's feel left true. Out. That's true. Everyone's having the most amazing day ever. Um and I, I, I don't believe it anymore. And so I, I've, I've just tried to step away from it. And I just tried to find just a forum where people yeah. can, can share these stories. I think those are the things that, that life's based on. I really hope that uh, you know that you find a lot of a lot of success with Heavily Pixelated because I think oh, if you thanks, it, buddy. yeah if you find success then I think our audience is going to find success because being comfortable with who you are and hey just realize that uh, you know never forget to play video games I think everyone's gonna be really happy about that's that. right um, I agree hundred percent yep and Scott I will let you have the last word if people want to find out more about you your show anything like that uh, where can they thing go? to do is to it's the easiest thing to do is go to the website, scottcjones.com. Um, you can find the show there. You can also find the show uh, in all the usual pa places, Google Play, iTunes, Stitcher. Um, and you can follow me on uh, Twitter. I'm at Scott C. Jones. Or uh, you can follow the show. It's at Heavily Picks, P-I-X. And uh, I think that's it. All right. Yep. Just give you a follow right there because uh, honestly, this was one of the best interviews I've had in a while. And uh, no offense oh, to everyone buddy, else, but, but this was a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> Scott, I, I, I really do hope that uh, you'll be willing to come back on the show in a while and give us an update. But uh, Whenever you want. Perfect. But in the meantime, everyone, uh, Scott C. Jones, again, heavily pixelated. We'll have a link to it in the show notes at computeramerica.com. And Scott, until next time, uh, have a great, happy holidays. Have a great one. Happy New Year. Same and to you. Uh, talk to you Same later. To you, man. Keep on gaming. You do. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Everyone, and there he goes. And yeah, uh, Mom Chipmunk in the chat room, absolutely. Uh, yeah, great guest. I could not agree more. Uh, as for the phony smile, hey, the smile is genuine right now. I had a lot of fun. Everyone, I hope that you had fun too. It was a great show, and looking forward to tomorrow. So, speaking of tomorrow, let me check. Everything goes as planned. You are all in for a treat where we will be talking with the one, the only, Mr. Ralph Bond. 
and Ralph Bond is of course our uh, you know our science and tech trends correspondent. If you want uplifting news about technology, he is your man to go to. So uh, everyone, Ralph Bond tomorrow, Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern, Computer America. Check us out, ComputerAmerica.com, on all the socials at Computer America. And in the meantime, have a great day. Thank you for tuning in, and be happy, be well. Bye, everyone.